Thank you, choir, for blessing our hearts this morning. It is now time for a sermon. And this morning, the sermon comes from the book of Psalm, chapter 27, from verse 1 through 14. And the sermon will be delivered by Reverend Dr. Teffy Lombo. The man has the devil set his ways, and the Lord direct his steps. Amen. Amen. The man has the devil set his way, oh, yes. but the Lord direct his step in Jesus' name. Amen. Christian friends, shall we put our hands together to work on Reverend Dr. Teddy the Lord to the people? Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. We bow our head with me. Almighty Father, we thank you, Lord, once again for bringing us before your throne of grace. We bow down our heads, O Lord, we say be in the name of Jesus, your Son, to please, Father, consecrate your message. And not your servant that will deliver you to Lord, speak through me, Father. Open our hearts, consecrate us, O Lord. Do not let us be hearers of thy words alone, but do us also. Amen. At the end of this message, Father, let us have something to take home. Let us have something to generate in our hearts, O Lord. And never let our lives be the same again. We thank you, Lord. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The theme of our message this morning, it's uh, also the same thing that is written in the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 9. A man's heart devised his way, but the Lord directed his steps. A man's heart devised his way, but the Lord directs his steps. The sermon is coming from the book of Psalm. Can we open our Bible place to Psalm chapter 27? The book of Psalm chapter 27. If you are there, say Amen. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies around me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing. Yeah, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou seest, seek ye my face. My heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Though has been my help leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy ways, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of my enemies. For false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as bring our cruelty. I have fainted unless I had 
believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say unto the Lord, the God bless his holy word. Amen. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his path. We read in Proverbs 16, verse 9, A man's heart divides his way, but the Lord directs his path. Which we can interpret to mean, If men make God's glory their end, and his will be a rule. He will direct their steps by his spirit and grace. In other words, all humans need their spiritual guidance from the Lord. Whatever they are doing and whatever they hope to accomplish in this world, without God's guidance, we are just like a lost sailor sailing the large ocean of human existence. Navigating the ship without a compass or a GPS to bring us to a destination without ending up with frustration, weariness, and a heart of despair. What then do we understand by that commonly used word, guidance? Guidance is a process by which humans or animals are channeled along a defined path, either to salvation or to destruction. There are different types of guidance. We have spiritual guidance, we have parental guidance, Hallelujah. we have leadership guidance, and others. We read in the Holy Bible. The accounts of how human race, kings, leaders, husbands and wives, men and women, through communication with their spiritual ears, which we often call the silent voice, beneficial only to those who are gentle, and humble enough to recognize that golden silent voice or either appearing in person or God sending his angels and even using domesticated animals or natural things which we have created to guide us throughout ages. Spiritual guidance do come in many dimensions through dreams, by direct instruction from God, through personal encounter with God, through the angels, or through the servants of God, or by servants, by signs, by stars, pillars of fire, and cloud. The types that are more familiar to most of us in the modern world are through parental guidance, pastoral guidance, through prophets, pastors, and executive guidance from those in authority over us in many other religions. We have read that the diviners also seek spiritual guidance from God who created all life in their quest for God's guidance on any decision beyond human reasoning or perception. The Old Testament gave us a variety of examples of God's spiritual guidance. God's method of guiding the human race vary according to the character to be guided. The circumstance prevailing at the time guidance was required. And in Genesis 12, 1 to 5, it's written now, the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and cause him that cause thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, God told Abraham to get out of his father's house so that he could receive and manifest his blessings from God. How many of us have found ourselves in such situations that because of the law of protection and financial security we were getting, from our present situation, we refuse God's advice to move on and face the challenges of life which will awaken the senses of entrepreneurship in us and make us to think about that golden solemn question. God, what have you created me to achieve in this lifespan? I have a heart and also giving messages to people about this confronting question 
So we are told not to travel abroad, since his greatness is in the country of his path. While for others, it is the opposite. In total disobedience to the spiritual guidance, many African young people have ended up losing their lives either by drowning or dying of heat and exhaustion while crossing the non-African Sahara Desert while some are still languishing in foreign prisons all because they want to travel abroad in sight of the great pastors. In those days of old, we read that God or his angels often appear to humans, but no more now. We may be wondering why was it that our Father, God, was willing to appear to his people in those days. But in our present world, only extremely few believers can claim to have that personal contact with God. Has God abandoned us? I should think not. It is not just we have all become less dependent on God. We are all trusting in our own understanding and we can compromise our loyalty to God. God advised Abraham to walk before him and remain perfect. And his name after receiving this blessing was changed to Abraham, meaning father of many nations. Does any one of us can honestly say in his heart that he is strictly walking before God without putting our self-interest first? In Genesis 81 15, Abraham was sitting in front of his tent when he saw three travelers approaching. He ran to welcome them pay them to rest from the sun and lavish hospitality on them, washing their feet because of the dusty route. Since there were no cars or tar roads in those days, he prepared meals before them without knowing who they were. To his greatest surprise, one of them opened up and told him in verse 9 of that Genesis 18, We are in Sarah, the wife. And he said, Behold in the tent, and he said, I will suddenly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. Amen. Amen. And Sarah heard where she was standing behind the tent door. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and were stricken in age. For Sarah to be able to bear a child at the age of 70, Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure? My love being old also. In other words, just like any one of us, after we are 70 years old, how can I be pregnant when my husband is also 90 years of age? They must be joking. So she laughed gently to herself as another false prophecy. Now, let us consider this dramatic event. And I want you to put yourself in the position of Abraham and Sarah. You just have three strangers. After eating the meal you offered them, now pronounce a prophetic message that medically is impossible. Will you not also mark such a message like Sarah did? Sarah was not in view, but over her the message, she however got a shock of her life when she was told by these strange travelers that they knew she was laughing. Hence, she was afraid. What did it teach us? How many of us have had an encounter with these messengers of God sent to us to guide us towards our blessing, but through ignorance, selfishness, lack of faith, and the words of Jericho we have built around ourselves when we are too full of the importance of ourselves, resulting in lack of humility to see or read between lines, we disregard the servants of the Most High God when they are sent to us. How many of us are lucky to be experiencing this spiritual guidance through our dreams? Some people do not believe in the power of the authenticity or the accuracy of messages received in dreams and hence tends to treat them as reflection or result of the press brain. Believers, however, do take messages received from dreams seriously 
As we read in the Holy Bible, in the story of Isaac's son, Jacob, and after Isaac had blessed Jacob, and sent him away to his mother's brother, Laban, in Syria to take a wife, what then happened? In Genesis 28, 11 to 15, he said, and he lighted upon a certain place and tried there all night because the sun was set. And he took up the stones of that place and put them for his pillow and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father. And the God of Isaac, the land where thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee. And we keep thee in all places whither thou goest. And we bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. This is the character of the living God that we are all serving. He is God of covenant. God of faithfulness who Amen. gives his promise. Amen. Amen. And Jacob away out of his sleep. And he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Jacob realized the significance. And the impact of this dream in his life. And he never looked back despite all the trials and tribulations he suffered under his uncle Levan, whom he served for 20 years in order to be a father of many sons. In Genesis 31, verse 14, it's written, it said, Thou, and this is Jacob telling his father in law, he said, Thus have I been 20 years in thy house. I sat thee fourteen years for thy two daughters, and six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages ten times. If you remember the story of Jacob and his uh, uncle, he went there to go and marry Rachel, but unfortunately, She had a senior sister, and the tradition forbids the junior sister to marry before the senior one. So they did not argue with him. They asked him to serve for seven years his father-in-law, and then at the end of the seven years, they will give him his wife. So he is at the end of seven years, they got him drunk, and then they sent the senior sister and leave to, to him. When he woke up in the morning, he found out that it was not the wife that he sat. So he said, what have you done this to me? He said, but this is the tradition. So what am I going to do? He said, well, you have to serve another seven years. If you want, Rebecca, so he served another seven years, making 14 years. And as soon as that was not enough, then the problem came about the shift to, he served another six years to make 20 years. And in those 20 years, Levan was just tricking like this. As the same way he tricked his own senior brother, Esau, to get it blessed. So, so you can't get away with mother. You can't get away with anything. You see? He tricked his own senior brother to get away his bath, to, to, to get his bath right. And his own brother, uh, brother in law also tricked him. So he served 20 years. Then from the book of Genesis 33, 35. You will see how God guided Jacob to eventually reach his final destination, which he anointed and called Bethlehem. And God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. How many of us can endure that kind of trial for a year? Just for a year, 
when we have other options before we decide to call it quit and thus miss our blessing. But if you are allowing yourself to be guided by the word of God, no matter the trial or humiliation that may often come your way, your heart will always tell you to endure because it is a trial which will one day end Amen. when God is ready to move you on to your new destination. Amen. Amen. Moses enjoyed the spiritual guidance of God after he fled from King Pharaoh in Egypt into the wilderness. He was taken care of by a rich Ethiopian priest called Jethro, who later gave him his daughter as wife. In Exodus 3, 12 to 14, here we read the assurance God gave to Moses after commanding him to go to Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from slavery. Here we have to differentiate God's command or instruction to us from God's advice or guidance. In Exodus 3.10, God gave Moses specific instruction. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people and the children of Israel out of Egypt. God does not have to plead or say, please, can I send you? Can he that is molded query his creator that molded him? Certainly not. But we can plead with God as humans with limited faculties to guide us or to pilot us on how we are going to accomplish the task that he has given us to do. No matter how difficult or humanly impossible, Moses also was afraid, but God assured him with spiritual guidance as we read in verse 12. And he said, Certainly, I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I will send thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, we shall serve God upon this mountain. God was telling Moses that after he had helped him to accomplish his task, he should come back to this same mountain, Mount Horeb, where he, God, appeared to him in the burning bush. And he shall serve God. That statement alone should have been enough assurance for Moses that his victory was guaranteed. But he yielded to fear of the flesh. But God was kind on him because he had been destined for that assignment. God did not abandon him throughout his historic adventurous journey in the wilderness. The Bible tells us that God was guiding them not with scouts, or with angels. But in Exodus 13, 21 to 22, we read, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Hallelujah. Amen. Can you imagine? To what extent our Jehovah God can make the way possible where there is no way for us? My brethren in Christ, why can we not start today to make ourselves ready and available to God to use? Yeah. Why do we still choose to remain adamant in our own wisdom as if we are the owners of our souls? Many also heard these spiritual messages in the times of John the Baptist. But when they realized that the kingdom of Jesus is not the kingdom of this world, they backslidden and left. Some also had the good news direct from our Lord and Savior and from the mouth of the disciples, but Jesus described them as the seeds that fell on the dry ground and among thorns. For the benefit of uh, <clears throat> our members that are not conversant with the Bible, can I please open our Bible to Luke again, chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, we're going to read from verse 4 to 10. Luke chapter 8, verse 4 to 10. <clears throat> Luke chapter 8, verse 4 to 10.
And when much people were gathered together, and we are come to him, out of every city, he spake by a parable. Verse 5. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was thrown down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Another fell on a good ground, and sprang up and bear fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried. He that had ears to hear, let him hear. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that are here? Then come the devil and take away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Be on the rock, are they which they hear receive the word with joy? And this has no root, but for a while believe, and in time of temptation they fall away. And that which fell among tongues are they which, when they have had go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But those on the good ground are they which, in, the, in a honest and good heart, have not had the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. They are not here as alone. What do us of the world? Unfortunately. If you have to ask how many of us can tell the lost parable of the sower, I am sure not many who remember this parable are much more on the meaning of this parable. The choice is yours today. To make up your mind which way you want to go. The gift of the Holy Spirit has already been given to you by grace through Jesus Christ as believers and Christians. It's now left to you to keep it and nurture it or allow Satan to steal it in order to enslave you. As for me and my children, we shall serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. My God is so wonderful and so mysterious that nothing is impossible for him. He can even use animals to talk as we also read the encounter of a great priest, Balaam, that he had with the king of Moab, when he asked Balaam to curse the children of Israel. If you remember, the children of, Ch of Israel <coughs> were traveling from the, in the wilderness to the promised land, and they had to go through the land of Moab. And the king of, ba uh, of Moab was so scared when he saw them. He went to go and meet this prophet called Balaam. Come and cause these people for me. Come and cause them. There are too many for me. I'm scared of them. He said in Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter 22, verse 7 to, and 5 to 7, the people has come out of Egypt. They covered the face of the earth and has settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drag them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. The elders of Moab a million left taking with them the fee for divination when they came to Balaam. They told him what Balak the king has said. Balaam also seeks spiritual guidance from God 
as we also read in verse 8, he said, spend the night here. Balaam told them, and I will report back to you when the answer that the Lord gives me. So the Moabite officials stay with him. Eventually, Balaam yielded to their pressure. He went with them without God's consent. But God surprised him on the way. God sent his angel to appear before and be visible only to his donkey. Because in those days there was no car. It was only either camel or donkey. So he was riding on his donkey, following the officials. But the angel of the Lord was standing in the way. And only the donkey could see the angel of the Lord. The rest of people didn't see him. And after the donkey had made so many several efforts to dodge the angel, he threw Balaam off his back and lay down. And Balaam was annoyed because he felt disgrace. And as we also read in Numbers 22, 27 to 35, and when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, he lay down under Balaam. And he was angry and beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and he said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey? which you have always written to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you to throw you off my back? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with the sword drawn. So he bowed down and fell downward. The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared it. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you are standing in the road to oppose me. Now, if you are displaced, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with Balak's officials. God gave guidance through angels to people including Hagar in Genesis 16, 1-12. If you remember who is Hagar, the Egyptian slave girl, to mother Sarah. In Genesis 16, 1 12, Sarah, Abraham's wife, had born him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to her husband, Abraham, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her which is the normal thing that we normally do as human beings when we run out of faith. And who can blame Sarah? She was already 70 years of age. But Abraham agreed. Like all men, because we are all men, we will agree, of course, to what Sarah said. So Abraham, after I've been living in Canaan 10 years, so Sarah, his wife took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, that is when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. They could see that. They said one wife is a challenge. Two wives, a boxing ring. Three wives. You had the Biafra war. For your part, and four wives, you better save for your for your for your funeral. 
for your funeral. Amen. 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 I know what I'm talking about. I'm going to hold you free. Amen. Amen. So when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abraham, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your hands, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Can you believe it? Abraham didn't ask for it. And now she said, May the Lord judge between me and you, as if to say she was the one asking Sarah to despise him. And of course, you can't catch a man by the elbow, you bring it out. So he said, your slave is in your hand. Abraham said, do we have whatever you think best? Then Sarah started to mistreat Hagar. So Hagar fled from her. The angel of the Lord from Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to shore. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from? And where are you going? She said, I'm running away from my mistress Sarah. She answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they may be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant. And you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone. And everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. You may be wondering who is Ishmael. And who is Isaac. For the benefit of the little time we have today, this is the cause of the problem we have in the world today. Through Isaac, we have the generations of Christians, the generations of the 12 tribes of Israel, and through Ishmael, we have the seven kings of the Arabic countries that form the Islamic states today. And you could see the rivalry that started from the mistake committed by our mother Sarah. All the descendants of Ishmael, the radical Muslims, are against the Jews. And that rivalry still continues till today. So, so it is not a political problem. It is not an American problem, but a problem that was grounded right from the beginning. But if you are reading your Bible, you not even listen to the politician because you know the source of any problem. And only God can solve it. Yeah. Only God can solve it. The mistake has already been made. Yeah. And nothing can, can solve it for us. So this is a fine example of divine or spiritual guidance which most of us must have experienced at that critical hour of our need especially those who survive life as refugees in war and crisis torn nations all over the world where there are nowhere to turn. How many of us have experienced or had stories of rejection from those in whom you have built all your hopes? Maybe your husband, maybe your wife, that we so call our soul mate when the going was good only to be woken up in the middle of the night and the one having the upper hand telling you darling we you see call you darling in the morning pack all your belongings together with your child and leave my house <laughs> i used to wonder when i am mate ready to divorce their spouse or sell the house or even divide or try the spouse with whom the two of you have struggled together to build a home. God saw the affliction of the helpless Egyptian housemaid of Sarah, Hagar, being driven from her home 
where she was already a second wife. But when there's no one for you, God is always there and will not desert you. Amen. But we guide you on what to do. Yes. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. Hagar obeyed the guiding instruction of the angel of God. And through her seed, God's promise was fulfilled in her life. How many of us have had a personal encounter from God for his messengers as he turned his stubborn hearts to spiritual guidance? Many of us are suffering today from different types of infirmities in our life. And Jesus Christ has been waiting for us to guide us, but we still continue to refuse his hand of friendship. I had my own experience of spiritual guidance, which is a testimony I'm sharing today with you. I had my own experience of spiritual guidance. When my second time, I came to Maryland from California, and the room I was supposed to occupy was unexpectedly occupied by a young nursing mother, then desperately in need. My pastor then gave me an option, either to stay with her or to share with some fellow Christian families who were also ready to come and pack my things the following day. That night, I slept. Before I was warned in a vision that the woman I ran away from, who masterminded my first exile back to California, will come down to rape me. In the morning when I told my reverend the vision, she acclaimed, this is terrible. You are not going anywhere. You stay here with me under my protection. And have been staying with her for the, for the past six years. We are no Jesse there. Go come and get me. The God provided my accommodation when I am now wise enough to always put on my chastity belt. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. Amen. You are laughing. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. In the New Testament, we have many instances where God guided his anointing. In Luke 1, 19 to 20, Angel Gabriel was sent to a great Jewish priest, Zechariah where he was ministering unto the Lord to announce the great news of the coming of the adventure through his family. That's why the fact that he and his wife were advancing age. Zachariah, of course, like most of us, disbelieved. And Richard Gabriel was not furious with him, but gave him guidance in form of advice in order to prepare his mind for the holy servant of God that his wife will be carrying for the next nine months. As we read in verse 19 20, and the angel answered said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and I'm sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak unto the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. When the angel Gabriel appeared to her mother, Mary, and announced the great tidings of the Immaculate Conception of our Lord Jesus Christ. The man to whom she had been betrothed became suspicious and uncomfortable, since he did not have any intimate relationship with Mary. But because he loved her very much, he planned to terminate the relationship quietly, so as not to embarrass her, the woman of his heart. The Lord saw his problem, and how to guide him. As we also read in Matthew 1, 20 to 25. But while he thought of these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. 
for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with a child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means, interpreted this, God with us. Then, Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord as bidding him, and he took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. God is always with his son, and his only parents. And when Herod Antipas sought to kill baby Jesus, his devilish plot was not hidden from God, and he gave Joseph spiritual guidance to guarantee the safety of Jesus. As we have also read in Matthew 2, 13 to 14. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt. The Bible told us that the three wise men were warned not to go back to Herod. And the result was the ruthless murder of thousands of innocent babies in Judea, which fulfilled the prophecy of the identification of the Messiah. After the resurrection of Jesus, Peter became the head of the flock. And when he came to the house of Simon the Tanner, God showed him a vision where he saw a vessel in which we are all kinds of beasts. And the Lord said, Peter, arise and kill and eat. But because Peter was a devout Jew and strict disciple of Christ, he resented the call and replied that he had never touched or eaten anything unclean. But the voice persisted. And admonish him, saying, What God hath made clean, thou must not call unclean. And the vision appeared three times. And what happened to justify this spiritual guidance? And let us also see Acts of Apostle 10 17. And now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should remain, behold, the men which we are sent from Cornelius, had made a query for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was so named Peter, we are not there. When Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Who was Cornelius? He was a believer, but a gentile that was also hungry for spiritual food and thirsty for the good news. And there was no one to satisfy his thirst for Christ. The Jews were forbidden, if you remember, to have anything to do with uncircumcised gentiles. Hence, under any circumstance, Peter would not have been able to follow anybody to the house of a gentile whether they believe in Christ or not. When God now told him that since he is the one who created both Jew and Gentile, both white and black, both Chinese and Mexican, no one must be looked upon as inferior or less privileged to receive the grace of God. When Peter got to the house of Cornelius, he had not yet finished telling them about Jesus Christ when the unexpected decision happened. The room was filled with the power of the Holy Ghost and descended upon all the household of Cornelius in the same manner. The disciples received it on the day of Pentecost. And Peter had no option but to baptize them all immediately. Peter had this to say when he was queried by his fellow Christians, Jews, 
brothers back in Jerusalem. Why? They have betrayed the brotherhood by baptizing Gentiles. In Azor Pasu 11, 15 to 18, he said, and I be, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remember I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them like gifts as he did unto us who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Who am I? What was I? That I will withstand God. When they heard these things, they had their peace and glorified God, saying, Then had God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Praise God. Amen. God's word and God's presence. Why God continue to reveal himself through Jesus Christ and his signs and miracles. Even Jesus saw guidance through simple prayer, spending hours at a time seeking his Father. When Jesus returned to heaven, he promised the coming of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, who would direct and guide believers. Throughout history since the new covenant sealed by Jesus' death and resurrection, God has continued to offer personal guidance in a variety of ways. But his promise of guidance comes through his word and his Holy Spirit. God has made his will clear to us in his word and through his Holy Spirit. Guidance also through others. The scriptures speak not only of God's guidance, but also of determining God's path for us through the guidance of others. The writer of Proverbs claimed to receive guidance through the influence of parents. As we also read in Proverbs 6, 20 to 22, he said, My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart, and tie them around thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleep, it shall keep thee. And when thou awake, it shall talk with thee. Proverbs also encourages his leaders, his readers to seek the counsel of wise people. We must seek the counsel of wise people. And we also read in Proverbs 15, 21 to 22, Fall is joy to him who lacks sense. But the man of understanding walks straight without consultation. Plans are frustrated. But with many counselors, they succeed. And now as we have wise counsel, we also have ungodly counsel. We have ungodly guidance. Just as people seek God's guidance, so many also seek guidance from many other sources. Throughout the Old Testament, we have mediums, we have diviners that were used to make decisions. If you remember the story of great King Saul, himself, he saw guidance from a medium and was judged for it. In 1 Samuel 28, 4 to 19. In verse 15, it's right here. <clears throat> After the Spirit of God had departed from King Saul, he went to meet a medium to summon up the ghost of Prophet Samuel for consultation. If you remember, when we ask ourselves, who said it? To whom was he said? Why was he said? That obedience is better than sacrifice. It was said by Prophet Samuel to King Saul, where King Saul disobeyed God's instruction, and then God rejected him and anointed King David to replace him. 
God was so him. They could no longer dream. They could no longer see vision. They could no longer communicate with God. Eventually, Prophet Samuel died. And he needed advice. He needed vision. He needed spiritual guidance. So he had to go to go and meet a sorcerer, a medium, to summon the ghost of Prophet Samuel from the grave. And what happened? Well, Prophet Samuel's ghost appeared to him. And Samuel said to Saul, Why has thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I'm so disgraced. For the Philistines make war against me. And God is departed from me. And answered me no more. Neither by prophets, nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee. That thou mayst make known unto me what I shall do. Children of God. This is a direct warning to all of us enjoying spiritual guidance. King Saul lost that relationship with God and God forsook him because of disobedience. And when God forsake you, you become a wanderer. Like the prodigal son who ended up sharing the same meal with the pigs in the, train, in the swine trough at times. God stepped into our unthinkable situation to reveal his omnipotence and majestic plan to people, to great Gentiles, as he did to King Nebuchadnezzar. In one sort of case, God provided his own prophet Daniel to speak to a king who had exalted the wise men of his land. As the King Thomas also taught us in the Bible study class in Daniel 2, 1 to 28. In verse 19 of chapter 2, he said, Then was the secret revealed to Daniel in the night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his. And he changed the times and the seasons. He removed great kings and set up kings. He gave wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that no understanding. He revealed the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness. And the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers. Who has given me wisdom and might, and has made me known unto me, now what we desire of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. In another situation, God revealed his majestic plan to keep favor of Egypt. As we also read in Genesis 41 1 to 36, Joseph was the man God had prepared to deliver his message. As we read in verse 32 to 41, and for that, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Amen. Now therefore, let Pharaoh look out, a man discreet and wise, and this is Joseph talking, and said him over the land of Egypt, let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years, and let them gather out the food of those good years that come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities, and that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not, through famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servant, <clears throat> Can 
can we find such a woman as this? A man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, that is not so discreet and wise as thou art, thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Can you imagine? Direct from prison yard to be second in command to the greatest king on earth in those days, the King Pharaoh. Is anything possible for God? When God is with you, who can be against you? The New Testament recalls instances of ungodly guidance as well. Oh, yes. Which are those coming from soothsayers, from sorcerers, from diviners. Two typical examples were, some, were mentioned in the Bible. One was found in other parts of 16, 16 to 22. We are false prophets or fortune tellers. We are led by evil spirits who could foretell fortune. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, it reads, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the fortune and future. He had a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her. At that particular moment, the spirit led her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and they are thrown out our city into uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept our practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rod. And the second example was the encounter again that Peter had with Simon the sorcerer. In answer of Paul's rule 8, 9 to 11, described Simon. Simon was also a believer who had the message, and he believed he was baptized. But he was a rich doctor. And people respected him. And then when Peter went there now to bless the people, he saw Peter. Truth laying out of hands. The people were receiving the spirit of the Holy Ghost. So he went to Peter and said, Peter, I beg you, this is money. Send that gift of the Holy Ghost to me. Now, whoever I put my hand, they too will receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people. And deceived the people until his end came, when he offered to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit from the Apostle Peter. As we read in Matthew Apostle 8, 18 to 23. And when Simon saw that the Spirit was given as the laying on of the apostles' hand, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of the God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. 
We do see have them all over the world today. How many times believer Christians have to run to them for spiritual consultation when we are faced with trials of life, when our faith is shaking and our trust in the Lord is at its lowest ebb. We forget the anointing in us. We run back to these false prophets, to these soothsayers, to consult. Should I still remain in the ministry? Should I still continue to be a pastor? Can you imagine it? Our parents did this, and there's no use denying it. Amen. But we thank God today, through grace in Jesus Christ, the salvation we have received at our baptism is now being manifested in us. Amen. And I pray to God, we will not go back again Amen. to serve the other gods. And this is why the Lord told Nicodemus in John 3, 3 to 7, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Amen. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. What does it mean to be born again? It is a common statement in the lips of every Christian believer and some claiming to be born again. But in real sense, they do not even know what it means to be born again. And these are wishy-washy Christian. The born will rule Christian. Yet if asked what the term born again means. Most church members could not give a clear explanation. The importance of this subject is shown in what Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3. Jesus is saying that to be born again is to be saved. Being born again is the plan of salvation that Jesus authored at Calvary. It is imperative that we understand what is required for us to be born again. All agree that when Jesus went to the cross, he brought in the means of salvation for everyone who will accept it. But what will happen at Calvary? What can it do for me? How do I accept what was done there in my own personal life? At Calvary, there were three steps to the work of Christ. One, death. Second, burial. And third, resurrection. And read in 1 Corinthians 51 4. It's very easy to see that these three steps make up the act of being born again, spoken of by Jesus. To die, to be buried, and to rise again. That is, to be born again. So we see that Jesus, through his death, through his burial, and his resurrection, brought for us the plan of being born again, spoken of. In John 3, 3, we are by, we receive our salvation. Amen. The fact that Jesus purchased the plan of salvation for us is the greatest news the world has ever received. The thing we must understand is that not only was it necessary for Jesus, to do something, but also it is absolutely essential for us to act upon it. Amen. To act upon what he did. Jesus told Nicodemus, ye must be born again. There are no tricks to spiritual guidance. All it takes is being in full and close relationship with God. Amen. 
No matter what difficulty or trial we may be going through, we must hold fast to our faith. I do not forsake God to seek salvation from big and gods who have eyes but cannot see, and have ears but cannot hear, or depend on our earthly possessions. Like the scripture says in Psalm 115, 7 to 8, our God is in heaven. You don't go whatever places him. But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them. And so we all who trust in them. May God never let that be our portion. Yeah. Through wisdom and guidance can only be found in the Lord. It's like when we know someone very well, we can guess what that person will do in a given situation. A child might think, what will mom want me to do here? A wife might think, what will my husband want me to do in this situation? Oftentimes, they guess right because they have a big close relationship with each other. By the same token, if we are committed to building an intimate relationship with God and know God very well and know His Word, then we'll be able to know God's will in most situations. It will be clear to us without even asking the cause, the comforter. We have established His seat in our hearts and we guide us because He is the Spirit of Truth. Amen. As the Bible says in 1 John 2, 27, But you have received the Holy Spirit, and He lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Scripture teaches you everything you need to know. And what it teaches you is true. It is not a lie. So just as he has taught you, remain in fellowship with Jesus Christ. Amen. May God of our fathers bless each and every one of us hearing these messages this morning. Amen. It shall be well with you all. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May God bless you all.